Okay. So hopefully this will all work. So this is a, a double act. Um, and it's, I mean, apart from the technological challenge, this is also the, uh, the, the pure vaporware talk. There will be no software at all here. Um, I'm just going to talk about something that it's sort of we're inte that we are intending to do. So the Dialogue Project Project, or DP2, until we come up with a better name for it. And here's another ancient slide. I don't know if you remember when I used this slide last, but I think it was probably at the Dyadic user meeting in 2003 or something like that. I wrote an article for Vector, which is still up on the archives, called Why APL Programmers Don't Use Libraries, um, which is actually something that I see as one of the biggest challenges for us as a community. Those, most of those of you who are here today have built your own libraries as part of, you know, be working in a large organization and using libraries that are there, or you've accumulated your own tool sets over working with APL for one, two, three, four decades. Um, but I think it's now time for us as a vendor to do something about this. Uh, maybe the old, you know, the, the old time users here don't, care about this, uh, but the new users definitely are going to demand a common way to describe software projects implemented in Dialog APL. And ideally they're going to want to start actually, when, when they come to APL, they've learned a bit about it, you know, their math teacher taught them a bit of APL, and they think, okay, now I'd like to try and build an application with this. At the moment they're just sort of stuck there in an empty workspace, and they have to figure out how to build an application. And while that was okay in 1985, it is not okay any longer. They want to go to a menu somewhere and say, I want to build a web server, a web service, a console application, a little GUI desktop application. Press a button and then end up with a little folder with 10 files in it and a button they can press to say run and have it up and running. Then they may be sufficiently motivated to carry on and put the math code into there. So. Um, so we needed to create that little folder and then we need tools to manage the source code even if you're only a one-man band or a one-girl band you are probably very quickly going to want to go back and see what you changed uh, yesterday. You go away from a project for a week, you come back, you need source code management, compare changes, revert to old versions and so on. And then you need to find tools and utilities to work with dates and strings. I mean, the libraries, we asked, I can't remember, Gita, who was it? We asked, somebody was asked to say, what do they look at when they're picking a programming language? A new recruit, yeah. Said, what, what is the most important thing you look at when you're selecting a programming language? Said, well, I look at the libraries that are available for the language before I look at the actual features of the language itself. Because there's this perception that languages are all roughly, you know, they, they vary a little bit. We, kn we know that isn't true, but still this is really, really important. Um, we need, one, once the project gets a little bit bigger and it starts depending on some of these tools, you know, maybe Dialog made some tools, there's a new version of them, you want a controlled way to pick up new versions or stay with the old versions and so on. And then, when it gets a little bit bigger again, you might want to try and build something to ship to other people. Maybe you want to start selling it. This tool should also allow you to say, well, I want to build a runtime system for deployment on this kind of platform. Maybe obfuscating, encrypting the code so that you're not letting your in IP out. Um, you should actually you should have been doing test driven development so this should actually have been the first thing on the list right Gianfranco it should have been right up here before you even picked what kind of application you were going to build uh, and of course it should run on all of Dialog's supported platforms so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think we should be what we should be building into this for each one of those uh, each one of those items so so as this is all just thoughts we have about it, right? We're thinking we might implement this over the next few months, a prototype. So we're really interested in feedback. If I say anything that doesn't sound right, please let me know what you think. So a DP2 project, when you've created it, is just a folder. It has uh, code in it and maybe some, uh, definitely some configuration files. 
And the source code and the configuration files are all standard Unicode text files. And the user will decide whether they want to use SVN or GitHub or no source code management system. We're not trying to build a source code management system. We're trying to build something that can easily be managed using uh, best practices in the industry today. Of course, we do have requirements that needs to be easy to use for APLers, but as long as we feel those uh, requirements are being met, we're not going to build our own system. And I know there are people who think we should be you know, putting source code in component files or FlipDB or something like that, but I feel very strongly that if we do that, it really undermines the whole purpose of, of running this project. So that maybe I'm listening. Phil, is Phil piping up now? Yeah. No. Do you hear me, Phil? I do. Yeah, yes. okay. So you'll, you'll have your time afterwards to, to correct <laughs> me. Uh, I mean, actually, Phil's part of this talk, which is about uh, an, a notation for constants, um, to me is closely related to this project because for me it's like, well, yeah, if we're going to put everything into script files, we need a notation for constants, and that's my motivation for being interested in it. Whereas Phil's point of view, of course, well, we need a notation for constants anyway, regardless of all this newfangled stuff that Kronberg wants to build. Um, and he's right, actually. Yeah. So, so actually, here is a declaration of something we're going to do, we're planning to do in version 15, is that, you know, the salt, uh, the salt system and user commands and so on are in some ways a small precursor to this. We've been thinking about, you know, I did a talk in 2003, We've been sort of slowly building up at least to uh, trying to convince new users. And we see new users to Dialog APL in the last few years typically all go straight for this without being pushed in that direction. They all feel text as a way of storing source code is obviously the right way to do things. And we've had this code written in APL. I don't remember how old SALT is now, but it's at least five years old, uh, may maybe more. I think we've reached the point now where we understand that well enough to design features that we'll put into the interpreter itself. So the interpreter knows how to load and save uh, source code in script files without having to have some APL code that Dialog has written to, to manage that. SALT does a whole bunch of things other than just loading and saving code. So SALT will continue to exist but we'll pull all the code to do Unicode text file processing out of SALT and build that on top of what we put into the interpreter. Um, I am one of the people who put my hand up when they asked for the Sharpies in the audience. So I remember a system called Logos at IP Sharp, which was much more sophisticated than what we're trying to build here. But one of the really great things about it was that you could put all your source code into a tree-like structure, and then you could write scripts that allowed you to build a variety of different runtime applications. So you could actually take a legacy application that had source code stored in component files and work, you know, combination of component files, workspaces, any structure you like, and you could import it into Logos, and Logos would build a script as it did the importing to regenerate the exact same runtime environment that you were using. So although the goal for this project in the short term is the kids who need to be able to click on a button and get a little web thingy and run that, uh, and we don't expect, you know, large-scale migration of legacy users or legacy applications, I should say. Users are never legacy. It's only the applications that are. Uh, the goal is that in a few years' time, you should be able to use this system to manage any application that's out there today. No matter where it, so it stores its source today, there'll be a way to rebuild it. So we imagine that of all... This is not the whole list, but uh, you know, all of the different types of runtime environments that applications get delivered in, you should be able to build from this. Eventually, and this is something people have asked us for several times over the years, it's, this is a difficult thing for us to do generally. We're not going to try and do this for version one of this tool, uh, but it is something that's sort of included in our, our thinking about it eventually maybe installers as well for these runtime environments. 
This is, I mean, I can sort of hear you sigh when you see this because this is the kind of slide that APLers have put up at every other APL conference you've been to for the last 30 years. You know, we will now collect standard libraries. Well, we will. <laughs> Uh, if you look at my server, if you get hold of a co recent copy of my server, you'll see that sort of it contains our current best guess at what an application needs. My server uses very many of these, uh, all of the ones that except, oh, even the SQL. My server has versions of every one of these utility libraries, and they've all been done um, in a way where they could be used for other projects. They've accumulated from other projects over time. Um, and although, again, we see this as something very closely related to this DP2 project, so that you have to be able to declare dependencies on them, get new versions from Dialog, download them from GitHub automatically, and so on, that tool library has to be a resource that everybody can use, regardless of whether they're using this DP2 project mechanism or whatever we call it. Um, but sort of it's part of the driving force uh, behind doing those things now. All of this stuff is going to be open source uh, up on GitHub, so everybody would be welcome to contribute to it. I don't know how we'll manage it if you really do start contributing to it. Of course, there's a huge workload involved in that, but uh, we'll do our best. Managing dependencies, again, just you know the current thoughts that we have about this, or I have about this, haven't really discussed this a lot internally yet. We've been too busy with other things. Um, designing this so that it's going to work well is quite a challenge. So Brian's actually done a fair amount of work uh, inside my server, which we think now works really well, declaring dependencies on things like the jQuery libraries and the SyncFusion libraries sort of having symbolic links to those rather than direct links. Uh, we, had a, we had a situation where we thought there was a bug in jQuery and we were able to, in just a split second, switch to using another version of jQuery, find out that wasn't the cause, and, and go back again. We're going to, you know, we pledge we will take a look at the other packages out there for this and uh, select that which we think is relevant for the APL market, build it into this. The J Software, I think, have a quite a successful package manager that they're using, so that there may be a good place to go. The GNU APL, how many people here have downloaded a copy of GNU APL and, and used it? I think there are actually four live open source APL interpreters at the moment. And there's GNU, there's NGN, there's NAS2000, and ELI, yeah, A+. Plus. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, so five at least. Um, and that's very good because occasionally we get an email that says, I tried such and such a system and that was fun, but now I need to build a real application. So can I have a copy of Dialog APL? Yeah. Um, and there's sort of two stages. If there's one, before you build your application, at infrequent intervals, you're going to want to download new packages, sort of big pieces like the R interface, if you're using that, and so on. And then there's sort of, you have these runtime dependencies where you need to load things. You need to be able to declare that at this point, I need this module, or I just need these two functions from that module, and I like them imported into this namespace without having to bring the whole namespace over and so on. So there's a lot of design to be done here to get this to work well. Um, but we do have some ideas about it. And as I mentioned, you want this all done indirectly so that you can easily you know, do things like substitute your database module with the mock database and run some tests uh, and so on. Um, and one thing that a couple of our, our more sophisticated users, is they really want, is at the lowest level below all this, when we go out to the file system, uh, they want to be able to intercept everything that we're doing at that level so that they can really build sophisticated redirection to go off to some completely different location and pick stuff up So, for designing more complex testing in QA environments, I suppose. Um, this is important, and we are certainly using it, uh, I mean, like in my server now, we're running all these automated tests. Uh, I don't know exactly how we'll do this. 
I think, you know, the, we had been having these discussions with Gianfranco again about, you know, what's a unit test and what's an integration test and that APL programmers, perhaps because they are, it's so easy for them to generate data, they mix up this business of, you know, exactly what kind of tests they're doing because they'll use APL to generate a terabyte of data uh, using part of the application. And um, they probably probably need just to have hooks in here so people can build several different kinds of test frameworks. But the dialogue will provide one or two of the sort of most, maybe Gianfranco will help us. Well, actually, he has already made available some, some t yeah. Um, so a, a couple of test frameworks will be part of this, but we'll also make sure to make it so that you can extend it uh, with your own, your own things. We'll build a whole bunch of sample applications so that the kids can say, I want a new one of any one of these things and make it very easy also for you to contribute. If you have a sample application, put it up on GitHub in a certain place. It'll become just part of that uh, package management demo application management system. So here's, here's the list I was able to come up with in about five minutes. Um, yeah, I don't think we need to go through those, but there's there's a lot of code that needs to be written. A lot of this code, though, to be fair, already exists. There's lots of this out on the APL wiki and so on. Um, but we think it's... I mean, there's a bit of a conflict here in this open source thing where everybody can contribute, but there's a lot of people who actually want the library that Dialog says is good and will support bugs in and so on. So I think even though we run it as a, a, an open source, we need to sort of split these libraries into the, the dialogue approved and supported uh, libraries and then make it easy to search and include everybody else's work as well. So link this to the APL wiki if we can find ways to do that so that whatever on the APL wiki becomes part of, you know, queryable here. So where are we with this? As I've said, you know, it's pure vaporware. Well, actually, we, you know, we have some of the libraries, or we think the beginnings of what could become the libraries. We've been experimenting in my server with actually implementing some of these pieces ourselves. Uh, I was hoping to present this version 0.1 to you here today. Didn't happen. Got distracted. So I'm now aiming for the spring, hopefully this winter, with Adam coming on board and our APL programming resource being increased by a very significant amount. We'll be able to take some first steps on this and present little prototypes to you. Uh, but it is something that I would expect to take several years to reach maturity. There'll be a version 0.1 next year get it out there. Hopefully some of you will actually use that and we'll get some feedback and then over the course of a couple of years um, it'll become something. I mean it should immediately be usable to the new kids so that they can get to that stage of having a the, the immediate effect of being able to get hold of prototype applications should happen very very early. But before we properly supporting legacy applications and being able to build you know import and build them could take five years. Uh, it depends on the, on the demand. So why will we succeed this time? Because we must. This is actually critical to our future now. Um, if we want to attract that, those new users, we just simply have to do this. And we're going to invest significant resource in doing this now. Uh, I mean, at IP Sharp 30 years ago, this kind of thing was working a bit because you had an environment where, in fact, you weren't making money selling people's time. You were making all your money selling time sharing, and therefore the efficiency of the programmers was paramount, and that, that company then allowed people to do a lot of work in that area. Then as we had a period where people were mostly selling consulting and so on, it became hard to justify. I think it was very hard for people to collaborate on this. But now we will, we pledge to drive this. So, you know, please think about it. Contribute, demand things. I will only use this if it does XXX. Um, and send us libraries. I mean, it, I can't process to look at everything that gets sent to us, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. 
And of course, so here's another quote from a philosopher, not John Scholes, as you might think, um, plea for simplicity and all that. This is, I think, is it 2,000 years old or, or more? Um, so we mustn't be strong arming everybody into using this. It has to be easy to use, ideally, and easy not to use. So if you just want to sit in a little workspace and write defense for your own personal use, you should not have to know that this thing exists. Yeah, so... Um,